Welcome to everyone who is joining us today uh, for the first Climate Slamposium. Um, we're just going to give everyone a minute or two to, to connect and get their audio sorted and get their cords and screens sorted um, and settle in uh, as you join us today. So we'll get started shortly um, as folks just kind of settle in and uh, welcome to you all. Welcome. I see a few more joining us as we as we wait here. Um, folks are just kind of filtering in as they uh, get some lunch in them, hopefully uh, find some sustenance to uh, support them over our climate symposium that we're about to engage in. Uh, as folks settle in, um, we're just going to take a minute and uh, we'll have a welcome. Um, I'll hand it over to uh, Linda Nellen in a moment to give us a bit of a welcome and help kick things off for our first climate symposium. All right, uh, folks will join us as we go, but I think we'll, we'll start things off today. Um, happy Friday, welcome. Uh, nice to have you all here with us today and thanks for choosing to spend your time with us today to, uh, to explore this great event. Um, welcome everyone to the first uh, student, research, uh, student Research Climate Symposium. This event was made possible through uh, partnership and collaboration between UBC Sustainability Initiative, the UBC Climate Hub, UBC Campus and Community Planning. Uh, the Center for Community Engaged Learning and SEEDS. Um, so it's a collaborative event that uh, is able to make it happen. And that's the beauty of collaboration. Uh, I wanna hand it over to uh, Linda Nowlin at this moment to uh, welcome us into this space today and help kick us off. Uh, Linda, I'll hand it over to you for a moment to introduce yourself and uh, welcome the crowd today. I think you're on mute, sorry. Linda might be having a little bit of uh, sound troubles at this moment. Linda, I've just okay. unmuted you. There you go. There we go. I was gonna say the host wasn't allowing me to unmute, but here I am and uh, welcome everyone. It's so exciting to invite everybody to the Climate Symposium. Uh, Megan will do a land acknowledgement shortly. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded territory of the Musqueam peoples here at UBC. But I'm just thrilled to uh, say uh, hello on this rainy Friday afternoon. We're so excited to hear from such a wide variety of students and their climate research projects, community activity, art, poetry. I hope we get a few slams in there. Um, we were really inspired by the two-day symposium that just occurred uh, by faculty sharing research across the university, across all sorts of different areas of climate uh, knowledge and research. And we wanted to also showcase what students are doing because we know students are just uh, really involved, passionate, activist, and wanting to take more action. So I just wanted to say welcome. I'm going to turn it back to Megan, but a huge thank you to all the organizers, particularly Megan and the Climate Hub. 
our two wonderful new climate emergency staff, pa Pablo Beimler and Nadia Joe, our wonderful comms team, John Garner and Natalie Ha, events planner, building manager, Tim Heron, um, and all our co-sponsors. We're just really thrilled to have the opportunity to work together. But most of all, I want to thank you, the students, for coming out and showing us what it looks like to slam down when it comes to climate. So thanks a lot and enjoy the afternoon. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that welcome, Linda. Um, and yes, we're hoping to showcase uh, this amazing student work uh, in such a variety of ways today. Uh, so we're thrilled that you could all join us today and explore uh, this wonderful student-led research uh, that intersects with uh, the UBC Climate Emergency Report um, and its uh, nine strategic priorities in many ways as well. Before moving on, um, as Linda noted, before moving on, I would like to first acknowledge that UBC campuses are situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and on the territory of the Silk Nogan Nation, for those who are joining from UBCO today. Indigenous use of these lands dates back to time immemorial. When talking about issues of climate change, we must also recognize and prioritize how and why processes of climate change disproport disproportionately impact Indigenous people's culture, language, medicines, kinship, and generational sustainability due to historical and ongoing structures of colonialism, genocide, and white supremacy. Further, that Indigenous women are disproportionately impacted by processes of climate change, and that Indigenous women, non-binary, and two-spirit individuals have always been at the forefront of climate leadership and action. We must individually and collectively make meaningful space for engaging with issues and actions of UNDRIP, reconciliation, decolonization, and honoring treaty rights, self-determination rights, free prior and informed consent rights, the right to sovereignty, and the need for giving land back in tangible ways. Taking time to consider how each of these issues and concepts intersects with our own lives and communities locally and globally is fundamental and necessary work. Um, so with that, um, helping to kind of ground ourselves and moving into some of these uh, climate research and climate uh, issues that we're going to explore today, uh, I just want to look at um, this. Uh, first of all, I just want to draw attention to a map. And also, if you're not sure about the lands you're on today, um, you can check out nativeland.ca uh, and it can help give a starting point for uh, looking at uh, the traditional territories that you might be situated on today. So I'd also like to just move into an agenda, a bit of an overview for our uh, viewers today and our community today to look at where we're headed. Um, we've just kind of gone through a bit of a welcome to everybody to get ground ourselves. Um, we're gonna move through uh, two sets of presentations, uh, a, a set one of presenters, and we'll have a, a bit of an art uh, check-in um, and a video break. Um, we'll move into uh, the new set of speakers um, for presentations that will transition into uh, some workshops, and then we'll have some uh, wrap-up remarks as well. Um, I also want to bring uh, folks' attention to um, our graphic interpreter that's here today. So uh, part of communicating climate change and climate change research is also about um, the methods and modes we use to communicate um, the knowledge that we're learning and, and sharing and, and building. Um, and so one of those ways is uh, looking at graphic interpretation of today's event. So today is meant to be fun and engaging and informative and creative ways. Um, and so helping us to explore that today is Andrea Hoff. Andrea Hoff is a multimedia artist, writer, and graphic novelist. Uh, her work originated, originates in uh, lived experiences and investigates themes such as neurodiversity, oceans, motherhood, and academia. Andrea's vis uh, visual textual writing can be found in publications including Broken Pencil, Display Canadian Design, and Room Magazine. She teaches drawing and ceramics workshops from her home studio where she lives as an uninvited guest on the never ceded ancestral and territorial lands of the Musqueam, uh, tsleil and Squamish peoples. You can find more of Andrea's work at her website, which uh, we will connect folks to um, after the event as well. We'll send out a bit of a resource packet with uh, links and resources to uh, all the amazing folks and works and links that we see today. Uh, so for today's Climate Slam Posium, Andrew will be creating uh, graphic recordings on recycled newsprint paper and cardstock using ink pens and beam colored uh, beam watercolor paints to color their images. Beam paints uh, is located in, and I'm, I'm, I apologize for my pronunciation, I haven't had to pronounce this before, uh, Mich Michigan First Nation. Uh, please, if somebody can correct me on that, I would appreciate that. Um, on Manitoulin Island. Uh, is the creation of artist and curator Anong Beam, who can, uh, and you can find Anong's story on her excellent palette of colors um, on the website as well, and we'll connect folks to that too. Uh, so just thinking about the, even the, the paints that we're using today and how they connect to uh, the themes of climate change and climate issues as well. 
Um, and as we move through the event, we're gonna check in with Andrea a couple of times just to give us some feedback um, on, on the process that they're going through and on the visual creations that are being engaged with to capture the themes that we're exploring today. And with that, actually, I would like to uh, shift our introduction uh, to Andrea again. Um, because this is, uh, Andrea is our first presenter today for our Climate Symposium, and so I'm going to give the floor over to Andrea uh, and take it away for our first, uh, our first speaker today. Andrea, over to you. Thank you so much, Megan. I'm going to share screen and... screen. <clears throat> Everybody can see that? Yeah, perfect. Drawing off the grid, recharging ourselves in the climate emergency. My work at UBC in um, language and literacy education works with young people through the methodology of creating comics. Um, the workshops that I host, um, 14 young people create comics about the future, and this is a method to both explore their ideas about where we're going, where we could go, but also a place that's safe to express their fears, anxieties, and to develop aspects of what's coming in, in relationship to agency, in relationship to resilience, and in the act of creation. So today, um, I'm going to have you do um, a small exercise in my five minutes, which I'm keeping track of the time, um, if you're willing. And um, for that, uh, you'll need a pen or pencil and a piece of paper. But first of all, I'm just going to start with some thoughts. Either we have entered the Anthropocene and it is game over for humans, who should therefore begin to come to terms with the extinction of themselves and others, or the advent of the Anthropocene finally offers humans the chance for revolution, social justice, and an even better planet. That was said by Colebrook in 2016. Now let's try practice together. In a minute, if you like, I'll ask you to get out the pen and paper, but for now, just sit comfortably. Close your eyes, please. Or really, close your eyes. I want you to picture the future. What do you see? What kind of future world do you imagine? What has happened with the forests and the oceans and the animals and the cities and the people? Let yourself really see it, this future world that we are heading towards and keep your eyes closed. Now picture the future as you would like to see it, really imagine it. What is different? How now do you see those same forests and animals and cities and air and technology and people? How are we as a people doing in this future that you would like to see? Stay in that possible world just for a moment. Let yourself see it, really see what is possible. Now open your eyes and now you need the pen and paper. With your pen and paper in the center of the page, draw a tree. This is you. Draw your tree in any way that makes sense to you. A tree from outside your window, from your childhood, from your imagination. Now along the branches, think of the people, ideas, actions, thoughts, and beliefs that support you, that help you feel alive and connected. Take a minute and write or draw them as leaves along the branches reaching out to the sky and name them. Name those people and those ideas and those feelings that support you. Now traveling back down the tree to the roots, imagine those roots and all they do, all the nourishment they bring you, but also what they touch, who they connect with, See the waters and the soil and the nutrients. Draw them if you'd like to. Deep under you, under that tree. And now imagine the forest and the other trees that are with you, near you. 
the air, the creatures, the birds and insects moving between your branches, making nests and homes along your trunk, along your limbs. Imagine all those connections around you, those that you support and those that support you. And take a moment and draw those roots or imagine those roots. Now stand back and open your eyes if you've been imagining this or look at that tree on the page and see how we are all trees. We are all part of this. This is not a practice in false hope. This is not about turning away from the struggles for justice for all justice. This is about letting ourselves be aware of other ways to produce this information, to gather strength and to realign and to create. Because as the world burns in more ways than one, we can create. We have the power to create new ideas, new futures, and new nows. There are people all over the world, Indigenous artists and non-Indigenous artists, working to bring the arts and the act of creation to the center of the climate emergency, to give us all time to breathe and time to envision what can be possible. Yesterday, Naomi Klein showed work by an artist called Jesse Mercer, who created a phoenix out of the keys from the burned houses in Paradise, California fires. Across cultures and geographies and time, the act of creating of art in more forms than is imaginable has been understood as a way to see the world differently and to envision new paths, to understand each other in new ways and to tell each other the stories of our world. In an upcoming panel at Oxford University, which I'll include a link to as well in the package, they posit stories, histories, art, music can help with this complex but necessary process of rethinking the world as we know it. Existential fears, moral complexities, loss, mourning, hope, and the struggle for livable futures are not new experiences for humanity. On the contrary, they're profoundly familiar and all societies have ways to explore them. Yet the climate crisis makes these struggles to understand the present and consider the future so much more complex. Collectively, we have the ability to move beyond an overwhelming absorption of climate science and its communication to see it, to understand it, and then through the creation process to find the strength, the critique, the resilience, the adaption and the transformation. Now think back to you as a tree and come back here whenever you need to. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrea, for that beautiful introduction and, and grounding us in that uh, first presentation and taking us on that journey. Thank you. Um, much appreciated. Uh, next up, we have uh, Fiona Beattie. Um, uh, next up on our stage, we have Fiona Beattie uh, talking to uh, decolonizing mapping uh, to inform climate change adaption on BC's coast. Um, Fiona, if you'd like to take that away. Sure, thank you so much. Um, just gonna share my screen. Can you all see that okay? It's not in its presentation mode yet. Um, and thank you for that wonderful opening. I feel like that really helped to ground everybody in the purpose of today. Um, so with that, I will give my talk. I'm concerned about climate change. It scares me. I see it affecting the world around me, the plants, the animals, the people. The iconic cedar trees of the Pacific Northwest are dying because the winters are too dry and the summers too hot. And these hot summers are exacerbating wildfires and filling the air with smoke and ash each summer now. And as I breathe in this toxic air, my mind stretches underwater to the sea creatures that are trying to go about living their lives in increasingly acidic water, water that is so corrosive it is literally dissolving their skeletons. I'm concerned and scared about climate change. Like many things in our world, climate change is an equity issue. One species of life on our planet, humans, is causing a disproportionate effect on the millions of other life forms here. And within that human species, there's vast disparity and inequity across those responsible for causing climate change and those who are most vulnerable to it. Some of the most vulnerable people and species to climate change include those who prefer to stay in the same places for long periods of time. 
Rockfish, for example, can remain faithful to their rocky reef homes for their whole lives over a hundred years. And glass sponges can grow in one location, building for generations to form massive underwater reefs that are over 9,000 years old. And indigenous communities throughout the world have stewarded their territories since time immemorial. Their culture, language, livelihoods, and food security are deeply interwoven with the lands and waters that surround them. So as their environments shift with increasing speed due to climate change, these species and peoples are being forced to rapidly adapt. So as someone who is non-Indigenous and who has benefited from the colonial and capitalist systems that have pitched our world into this social and ecological crisis, I have to ask myself, what can I do to reverse these patterns and how can I contribute to healing our earth, our ocean and our communities? And this question is what motivates everything that I do now. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to speak to how I try to advance ocean and community health through my research. Specifically, I'm going to share how I bring decolonization and reconciliation into my research process to advance the equitable creation of knowledge. Now, much of my research involves using maps to identify places that are vulnerable to climate change. And I document why these places are important so that decision makers can protect them. The maps that I'm creating identify ecological hotspots, cultural sanctuaries, recreational havens, and economic hubs. And I use maps because they're super useful. They're, they're very precise and intuitive, and they've been used for centuries to support planning. But that said, maps are also one of the primary tools of colonization. They were instrumental in the settlement of this part of the world, not only due to their use in navigation, but also because they helped to erase indigenous knowledge systems and languages. So for example, when you look at this map, all you see are English place names. And many of the places were named after explorers like Captain George Vancouver. Outrageously, some of the most striking waterways and mountains here were named after European military folks who never stepped foot in this part of the world. For example, the body of water where I work, Howe Sound, is named after a British Admiral, Earl Howe. And a hugely epic volcano here was named after the Italian General Garibaldi. Neither of these guys ever visited Canada, let alone the Pacific Northwest. And the reality is that there are so many names that were given to the mountains and waterways here long before European colonization. The Squamish nation, whose territory I work within, have three names for Howe Sound. Atkatsum is one of them and references the journey by canoe from the head of the fjord up in Squamish out towards the Strait of Georgia and beyond. The direct relationship between the place name Atkatsum and the ocean here is clear. This body of water was used for transportation and for connecting people and villages dotted through the nation's territory. Other place names tell different stories, stories of transformation, of peace building, and crucially, of how to live in harmony with each other and the more than human world. So as English place names gradually replaced indigenous ones on maps and in people's minds, the indigenous knowledge associated with this landscape and the teachings for how to live here was similarly replaced with stories of military conquest and colonization. So at this point, you're probably asking yourself, okay, this is cool, but what does the colonial history of maps have to do with climate change? Well, simply put, our society needs to adapt to climate change now. We need solutions now. And if indigenous communities and knowledge systems continue to be excluded, then we certainly risk perpetuating the extractive and inequitable systems that got us here in the first place. So for me as a non-indigenous researcher, this means that I've prioritized building relationships with the Squamish nation so that we can partner together on research. And through this partnership, we're bringing the nation's language and knowledge about their territory to the forefront of our work and of our maps. And this knowledge is providing invaluable context for how Atkatsum has changed through time and informs our adaptation strategies so that we can build healthier and more equitable ways of living here. So circling back to my original question of how to protect our ocean and communities from climate change. First, I believe that solutions require creativity in challenging the status quo. In the research arena, this means pivoting away from the prioritization of Western scientific knowledge and towards acknowledging and upholding multiple ways of seeing and understanding the world. Doing this will paint a more holistic picture and also serve to engage and include a much broader audience. And in practice, this can look like using stories and art alongside graphs and maps to study and understand climate change. This presentation, for example, includes the work of two local artists who live in Atkatsum and whose paintings are incredibly compelling, more so than my words alone. Second, I'm learning that communities know best which adaptation strategies work for their waterways and lands. So researchers who want their work to translate into climate action have a responsibility to work in partnership with communities and to develop research questions together that satisfy their needs. This doesn't happen enough, in my opinion. 
And finally, perhaps most importantly, we have to acknowledge that climate change impacts every aspect of our society from what we can eat to where we can live. So we need to work together with folks across the board on solutions. And this means emphasizing collaboration and relationship building throughout all that we can do. So I'm still overwhelmed and scared by climate change, but the stronger emotions I feel now are inspiration and courage because the collaborative approach that we're taking in this tiny corner of the Pacific Northwest is leading to the equitable creation of knowledge that's informing climate adaptation here. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and thank the Squamish Nation for their guidance throughout my research process. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, I will never look at a map the same way. Um, and I think that's important. Um, and I, I really appreciate how you were talking about the intersections of, of you know, art and power and land and language and culture and commemoration, all, all in the powerful reframing of a map. Um, so thank you so much for that. That uh, gives us a lot to think about. Um, our next, uh, our next presenter today uh, is Madison. Um, Madison will be addressing closing the adaption gap in mountains lessons from the Himalaya. Madison, if you're ready to go, we're eager to hear your presentation. Yep, sounds good. I'll just take a second to put that on. Is that looking all right? Great. So as all of us who are here know, the climate is already changing. I don't need to convince anyone of that. Um, and people are already in the process of finding ways to adapt and live with new realities. But there is a gap between the changes that are being experienced and people's adaptation to those changes. So. Today, I'll introduce you to some characteristics of this gap in a broad sense and how we might break that down into more manageable pieces. Um, and particularly, I'll discuss how they apply to mountain regions of the world, which is where my work takes place. And then I'll also illustrate with a couple specific examples of adaptation from my research in a community forests in the Indian Himalayas in a place called Uttarakhand. Um, Johar Valley is the name of the place. And this is from my dissertation research. So I came to this topic through an opportunity to work on a systematic review project, which was looking at um, a, a huge body of peer reviewed literature that was relevant to mountain regions and, and trying to understand the characteristics of observed adaptation. And we produced this paper primarily as a contribution to the IPCC AR6 Working Group 2 cross chapter paper on mountains, which will be coming out in around February. Um, and we learned some really interesting things in the process of this review. We found that um, not only was there a gap between climate change impact and observed adaptation, but there were actually several different like, sub gaps. Um, and this is all specific to mountains, but was more generally applicable in a theoretical sen sense to other environments as well. So we found for one that this is kind of the obvious piece. There's a gap between people's exposure to climate impacts and the, um, and the level of, or the total options available for them to adapt. And then below that, there's a what we call a realization gap. This is the difference between the sum of all those options in theory and the actual level of adaptation that people are able to enact. So if at that level, the, the kind of between the red line and the yellow line here, we have um, the total gap in adaptation. But uh, what, what I found really interesting is that we have actually a third gap, which we termed the coherence gap which shows the proportion of adaptations that are actually not well aligned with established goals and objectives on other metrics. So the difference between the, the total, the kind of the good adaptations or the adaptations that really work and the adaptations that are, are, are not working, the adaptations that are causing inequities, the adaptations that are compromising climate justice uh, and exacerbating other problems which compound climate change. So in mountains, as you might imagine, people are up against some very hard limits to adapting to climate change. Uh, and you can see in this photo, the geography of the landscape means that these are disaster prone, difficult places to live. And they're very, very high, highly exposed to climate change. 
So ultimately, there's really only so much you can adapt to those changes, particularly as the frequency and, and severity of disasters increases. So this exposure gap is the gap between the magnitude of climatic exposure and the sum of all the options to adapt. So closing this gap me requires one, mitigating climate change, and also increasing the availability of possible adaptation actions. So in Johar Valley, where I work, one of the best ways to do this is through managing community forests. So these, of course, contribute to mitigating climate change by capturing carbon in at least a small way. But they also help mitigate disaster damage by preventing erosion on hillsides and providing people with a social safety net when they're in need. Forests actually expand the envelope of possible options. And the realization gap, as I've said, refers to the difference between what options are available and what use people can actually make of them. So there might be ways in which people could adapt, but they can they really make use of it? Can they really follow through? A lot of the barriers here we consider soft limits, so financial barriers to adapting, governance issues, equity issues. And in Johar Valley, one of these are reducing the, the real gap is that there are civil society organizations that are trying to improve the viability of pastoral livelihoods, so people who herd sheep and goats mostly. Um, and they're doing this by securing land tenure and access to grazing land, and also providing finance to breed back more climate tolerant and predator resistant varieties of goats and sheep. So this is a really innovative way to actually expand the envelope of potential options, and also improve people's access to it at the same time. And lastly, we have the coherence gap. People have taken steps to adapt, but maybe they've done so in a way that makes things worse. So uh, responses to climate change often fail to achieve their goals and also have unintended consequences beyond climate change. So addressing this means making sure that actions that are sustainable development goals and other kind of key principles that are articulated in international agreements. Um, and in, in my research, what I'm finding with community forests is that one of the best ways to close the coherence gap is to address gender equity. So local initiatives have been trying to empower women as forest stewards and increase the representation of women in forest management. And this not only helps address women's livelihoods, it also helps improve conservation. So it helps reduce the risk that climate adaptation efforts will result in unintended effects on the ecosystems that surround these places and that make it possible for people and other and more than humans to live here. And so the closing the coherence gap I see is really critical for climate justice for both present and future generations. Um, and it's it's been really inspiring to work in these places. I think I'm, I'm struck by the by the balance of hope and and challenge that we're all facing here and i've found that in my own work one of the most inspiring one of the most inspiring things has been to watch the autonomous adaptation efforts of people like forest stewards in the himalayas uh, try to come to grips with changes and make really inspired and innovative efforts to do so thank you all Thank you, Madison. Um, really appreciate the, the reflection there on the balance between hope and challenge. Um, I think a lot of folks feel that these days with um, trying to maintain that and navigate that. So I appreciate that you uh, helped put, us, put that in perspective a little bit uh, in this presentation, much appreciated. Um, up next, we have uh, Simone Rawal. Um, Simone is um, runs a, a podcast um, called Anthropos. Um, and I think today we are going to uh, play a, a bit of a, a promo teaser from it. But uh, Simone, if you'd like to just step in and, and do a quick introduction for it, if you wanted to. Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Simone. Um, as Megan said, I co-founded this podcast called Anthropos um, with my friend Sadashma Thapa, who is also joining us here from Indiana today. Sadashma, do you want to say hi? And yeah, so Anthropos was this vision to start bringing voices and stories from the global south. And this year we focused um, on South Asia. So we have a little glimpse of Anthropos here today with this video. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. 
Um, I'm just going to share a portion of my screen here so that we can watch this video. Hello, everybody. I'm Simone. I'm Satashma. Welcome to Anthropos. With Anthropos, we'll be covering a different environmental issue every month. And we will be engaging in conversation with various people from different communities. Hoping that we will better understand the climate crisis together. We have benefited so much from the mountains, the Sherpa people. And my grandfather used to say, like, the mountains took care of us. Now we have to take care of the mountains, right? And so that's something that is a philosophy in my in my family. And so today, you know, all the everything that's happening around the world, our, our, our sort of global modern lifestyle has impacted the mountains. And so it's now our turn to look after the mountains. And so we Sherpas feel this very strongly and you know we are trying to do our best to protect the mountains that have protected us for so long. Community forestry has been a very important part of Nepal's uh, forest cover uh, uh, recovery, uh, forest cover back to the increasing trend. And I think there there was a vital role that believing in people, uh, believing in community who are the primarily stewards of resources, the concept has promoted so much, is doing well. A sustainable city is one where everybody um, feels that they belong, where they have the tools to make the city what it is, one that is healthy, one that is diverse, uh, one that is livable, and one where people uh, want to stay forever. Use our old clothes. We um, inherit old clothes and jewelry from our um, parents, our grandparents. And even after we're done using those, um, we, we just don't throw away stuff. I've seen my mom um, using them as uh, things to clean. Like I have taken clothes from my cousins. I have given my clothes to my cousins. They, I think they should take some culture from like from our subcontinent and I think yeah I think we should become the face of sustainability and they can follow our steps because because we are sustainable but we are not the face of it so why not just make us the face of it and also follow our steps we should really recognize that the water crisis is not simply a function of lack of water or these unequal supply demand gaps right it's fundamentally one of unequal water distribution, access, and use that's shaped by institutions that range from the village to the national policy scale. I will take you to the, uh, the Buddhist narrative of um, adding a drop of water into the ocean, right? So if you add a drop of water into the ocean, your water droplet remains a part of that ocean unless the ocean dries up. So the action of Bhutan on climate change, I mean, if you look at the whole uh, wide scale of things, um, the 6.8 um, million tons of CO2 at a global scale is nothing. But what small Bhutan, what little Bhutan is doing, has done, is showed the world that it is not just uh, feasible to develop the way we have done, following a business as usual um, scenario, we need to change and change fast. Uh, therefore, uh, the, the knowledge and experience uh, uh, of the elderly people in the particular communities uh, would be useful in uh, disseminating the climate knowledge because some instances, uh, as we all know, uh, if we if the people uh, tell uh, them uh, these kind of things more technically, they can't understand. But if uh, if the if the people living in the same community can share this experience with the others, with the young peoples, then then it will be more uh, effective in disseminating the knowledge. You can listen to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, and other platforms. You can also find us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, so that was a really wonderful insight into the Anthropause podcast uh, that folks can check out. And again, we'll connect folks to uh, these resource links um, in a, in a follow-up email that connects everyone to uh, these great resources and, and projects that folks have underway.
Um, thank you so much uh, to our first set of presenters today. Um, that was a really lovely and insightful and um, creative and imaginative um, opportunity to explore some of that work alongside you um, that, you, that you're working on and that you're bringing to the community and helping to uh, raise awareness and um, help educate us today on, on some of what that looks like. So much appreciated. Um, at this point, we're just going to head into a pause. Um, yeah, if, if folks want to give a clap for all of our presenters, um, uh, I'm just so appreciative for the work you do and um, the voice you bring to it um, and the perspectives you're, you're engaging in. So um, really thankful for, for you all today. Um, and then I just want to um, head over to Andrea actually uh, to do a quick check-in um, on some of the art that's been, um, some of the graphic illustration that we've been engaging in, um, that Andrea has been engaging in as, as we move through this process. So Andrea, if, if you wanted to uh, have a quick check-in with us. Sure, hi everybody. It's a fast, it's a fast one. <laughs> it's wonderful how fascinating these uh, performances and, um, um, sharing of ideas and sharing of research. So I'm starting to kind of get a bit of a sense of some of the pieces. They're kind of coming along like this. And then um, if you can see Anthropos here, Simone's, Madison's and um, Siona's. Um, and then I'll be working on them at the end to build more onto them and add more of the uh, visual elements. That's amazing. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's really lovely to, you know, bring an artist lens to this, um, specifically your artist lens that you're bringing this to, to this right now um, as part of this process. And we look forward to where where you take it today uh, as well. So we understand it's fast too. So you're we understand how busy you are. Madison, I see your hand up. Is is there something I? Yeah, I just wanted to say those are amazing, and I'm really excited to. It's such like a, a fun, tantalizing little glimpse. I'm wondering if if and when we'll get to see to see the the completed version of that I, I unfortunately won't be able to attend the full duration of the session so i'm just wanting to ask if we'll be able to see these somewhere absolutely and that's a great question um yes um as andrea works on these um we'll make sure that uh what is produced and what is created and what is kind of um brought into being via andrea um and their imagination um we'll share that with folks uh, as well um for all attendees and presenters as well so that's something we'll connect folks to as well um to make sure that you get to see where that where that tell progressed to and from yeah thanks for checking in on that um, so now at this moment, um, I just want to kind of head into um, a bit of a, a brief uh, pause to give you all a chance to use the loo or get some water or some sustenance. We're kind of doing this over our lunch hours sometimes um, or have a little move in a stretch break wherever you are. Um, and as you do that, um, we're just going to play a couple of cool climate videos. The first video is by the Climate Hub, which is envisioning what the year 2030 looks like and feels like at UBC. Um, and then the second video is um, a silent video created um, by an artist that was looking at the IPCC um, haikus or, or cr created a haikus to look at the IPCC report. Um, and so we have a video by that artist as well that we're going to play. Um, so folks, if you if you have already eaten and you don't need to use the loo and don't need water or you can stretch and watch at the same time. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen again. Sorry, just a second. There we go. Okay, so this is the first video uh, that I'll connect folks to. I kneel into a dream where we don't bury our heads in the sand, but instead we plant our roots. We watch them grow and tangle in every direction, then pick the fruits, I mean vegetables, to savor together. Look for a world where people can express their gender identity in whatever way they want, without the judgment of professors, peers, and on-campus visitors. Where UBC ceases to give space for alt-right groups to spread transphobia and attempt to devalidate gender identities. We see our space as a collective, a single heartbeat of compassion, of commitment, of forgiveness. 
We hold compassion for those that are just discovering the beauty within community. We commit to holding each other accountable. We forgive those who have made mistakes. We honor our individualism as a gift, and we see our collectivism as a mighty superpower. Whoa, would you look at all those hands? Collaborating hands, interconnected hands, creating hands, mending hands, caring hands. All these hands, they're honored for their essential work, and not one hand is invisible. Grow movements out of chalkboards, drawing the world we will water and imbibe. Feet on the ground, head in the clouds, learning mutual liberation. Still listening? Boundaries between disciplines will be blurred into oblivion as we all view through variant lenses, intersecting understandings, multiple truths and worldviews in kaleidoscopic fusion. We are telling new stories and retelling old ones. They are full of resistance and resurgence. They feel our collective grief and share our hope. Watching this ad could save you 100 hours or more in 2021. <laughs> Ooh, that was a lot. Abrupt finish. Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, I really, I love those two videos uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, one is folks at the Climate Hub um, really we're able to dream up some really lovely and wonderful um, ideas and, and futures and systems um, and, and share that and put that together in really creative, beautiful ways. Uh, and the second video is, is 
is quiet and very haiku-like um, and uh, was able to use art and poetry in a way to help communicate again. It's the modes and methods of communication, of climate communication. Um, the IPCC report is heavy and dense and it was a really interesting way to create climate communication and community connection um, on a really important issue. So I really appreciated that. And we want to share those with you. Again, we'll connect folks to all those if anyone wants to watch them again or share them in their own networks. Uh, so with that break, I hope everyone is feeling um, taken care of and stretched and watered and fed um, and, and ready for our another, uh, another set of amazing presenters today. So we've just moved through our first um, presenter lineup um, to hear some amazing research that's being done. And we'll move into our second set of presenters today. Um, we have uh, Saudia and Amber and Mamdi and Kevin and Leah, um, and we'll, we'll meet them in that order as well. Uh, so first up, we have uh, Saudia coming to uh, talk to us about, hi Saudia, nice to see you today. Uh, Saudia Ishak today uh, on how provincial regulations and guidelines are supporting uh, sustainable stormwater management in BC. So over to you, Saudia, welcome. Hi everybody, I'm Saudia, nice to see you, Megan. And uh, yes, uh, let me just share my screen and then... Uh, we can continue. This one's Okay, so today I'm going to share a part of my PhD. Um, can you see it? It's okay. Yeah, okay. So as this uh, presentation is part of my PhD research and uh, in my PhD research, I'm basically interested to study how the provincial regulations and guidelines are supporting the um, development of sustainable stormwater management in BC and in other provinces of Canada. So uh, before uh, moving forward, let's see how do we define stormwater and stormwater management. For my research in my work, stormwater is simply water that originates from rain and um, it, it includes snow and ice melt. It travels over the surface as runoff and is conveyed directly to the nearby streams, river and other water bodies. And by stormwater management, we mean any effort by which we can reduce runoff quantity and improve the uh, quality of that runoff to control flooding and protect the aquatic ecosystem. So now let's see what is actually the problem with stormwater or the issue with which we need to deal when we talk about stormwater management and how the regulations play an important role in this management. So um, the problem with stormwater management starts with urbanization, which means that our cities are growing and we are constructing more buildings and roads in our neighborhoods. Due to urbanization, there is an increase in percentage of impervious cover, which decreases the water infiltration in soil. And uh, in relation to the climate change, it means that uh, our uh, uh, temperatures are rising and uh, there is more intense and more abrupt rainfall patterns, which further affects the infiltration capacity of soil. So when it rains, water quickly fills the uh, drains and results in flood, soil erosion, and destruction of the aquatic habitat. Therefore, um, there is a need to consider stormwater management and offer solution and study um, the ways in which we can increase the infiltration of runoff in our soils. So in modern day uh, stormwater management to overcome these challenges due to um, increased rainfall and uh, increased temperature, modern day uh, stormwater management evolved new practices of using nature-based infrastructures or the green infrastructures. Green infrastructures are simply the vegetative or plant-based structures that imitate the natural water cycle in post-development scenarios. From an ecological point of view, these infrastructures are highly useful to increase infiltration of water into soil, as well as pollutant removal. And the few notable examples of green infrastructure, which are very common around us, include the development of green roofs, rain gardens, 
swales, permanent pave, uh, permeable pavements and wetlands. Now, uh, how do we, um, why do we need to study the um, provincial regulation and guidelines? The idea is to, I mean, uh, in Canada, in Canada and all the provinces in Canada, there is, um, there is a huge um, promotion for the development of uh, green infrastructures in the neighborhood. The idea is to um, overcome the challenges of uh, urban flooding, aging infrastructure, and climate change. However, the extensive use of green infrastructures requires establishment of regulations because these regulations play a central role in achieving the targets of uh, runoff quantity and quality management and uh, they're also essential to build the consensus, consensus among diverse stakeholders mm, so that um, if we if we are comfortable that there is a just distribution of resources and all the uh, and the rights of all the water users are reserved in my research, I have found that there is a limited understanding of state of stormwater regulations and guidelines relevant to the promotion of uh, sustainable runoff management in the urban settings. Therefore, my work aims to examine the stormwater regulations uh, of um, BC and identify opportunities to use uh, and incorporate green solutions in provincial stormwater management. So in simple, my research question is how do uh, provincial guidelines and regulations support um, sustainable um, stormwater management in the province? Um, for this, I uh, to answer this question, I identified a list of core criteria and developed an ordinal scale uh, ranging from one to six to track the progress toward implementation of green solutions in the province and in other provinces of Canada. Here, I'm not going, going into the details of that methodology, but I would like to share the results of my study, uh, specifically related to um, province of uh, British Columbia. I have found that in BC, at the municipal level, the most important guiding document are the official community plan, which provides uh, uh, broad objective to manage uh, land use and urban development. And in addition to that, other important document is liquid waste management plan that guide municipality on actions with respect to the management, collection, treatment, and disposal of the storm water. So in these guiding documents, we see that provincial government of uh, BC um, strongly recommend the use of green infrastructures to reduce runoff volume at the site of a region, and these infrastructures can be introduced as absorbent landscaping by using vegetation and organic matter, infiltration um, facilities, green roof, grassy areas, um, rainwater reuse facilities, and wetlands. So um, in this slide here, I would like to share the detailed results of my assessment. Figure one shows the score of BC within each of the eight criterias. And uh, um, this figure shows that among all the criteria, hydrological function, which means or uh, which relates to the explanation of natural hydrological cycle and water balance of the site. This criteria or uh, this um, aspect of the stormwater management and green infrastructure is um, highly uh, promoted in the guidelines, whereas the information regarding to the operation and management of green infrastructure is limited in the guidelines. In addition to this, uh, I have assessed the scores of other provinces and an interprovincial assessment of stormwater regulations for promotion of green infrastructures is given in figure two. In uh, figure two, we can see that among all the provinces, BC has an aggregate score of 4.6 mapped over the ordinal scale. Thus, uh, we conclude that or uh, this is very good um, actually for BC. It's very good because it says that in BC, green infrastructures or green technologies have become part of mainstream stormwater management and the province is categorized as highly nature friendly because extensive guidance is available on the development of these technologies in the province. And we hope to see more and more um, implementation of these technologies around us. So um, this is all for today. 
and uh, thank you guys. Thank you, Sadia. Uh, it was pouring rain when I when I came in today, and I actually was thinking about as I stepped into the street into a rushing kind of river in the street um, about where that water is going and what is it doing and what are we doing with it. Um, and so you gave me a lot to think about in relationship to that experience this morning. So thank you for that, and I'll I'll think about that as well. Um, and uh, moving on to our next speaker uh, today is um, Amber Rana, who is going to be exploring environmental impacts of institutional building. Uh, Rana, are you ready to go? Or uh, Amber, sorry. Sure, sure. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, so uh, my topic is embodied carbon in institutional buildings. This is not part of my PhD research. It's related to my work, but it's basically the work I'm doing for the work plan as a work plan pos uh, position with UBC sustainability on campus. And it's a kind of part of UBC policy as we are developing it and it's a multi-year project and I'm just doing a bit of a part of it. So first of all, um, when, whenever we are talking about low carbon buildings or we are talking about reducing carbons of the built environment, we are usually talking about the operational buildings. We are talking about how can we reduce the energy? How can we reduce, uh, we use more renewable energy sources? How can we use solar powers? How can we use the ground source heat pumps? But we are rarely talking about the embodied carbons. We are talking about new technologies available. So it's a kind of a big problem right now that uh, all our standards and all our bylaws are made, uh, based on operational energy and all of, sorry, operational carbon uh, reduction and very little has been done on the body carbon. Like just in this year or uh, like Tor Toronto has adopted a standard in which they have mandated that embodied carbon should also be reported. Similarly, Vancouver has recently done this, but overall in Canada and in North America, the position of this embodied carbon is not very good. And as we are approaching more to net zero buildings, and we know that the changes of climate change are um, uh, giving more and more common, uh, and so the controlling not only the operations for carbon, which we are already reducing, it's important, but we need to control how we can reduce the embodied carbons. So basically, uh, when we talk about operational carbon, we are talking about uh, carbon that is coming from using energy in the form of lighting, electrical appliances, heating systems, cooling systems, uh, hot water heating. Um, so it's part of the all anything that's related to the operation of the building. Anything that consumes energy, uh, that 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 will give us the operational carbon. And then there's a avoided carbon. This is a carbon that is whenever we use any kind of material. For example, when we're talking about a wood in a wood using the walls of the buildings, then uh, it's, uh, where does it wood? It also um, like it is uh, the trees are cut that consumes energy. Uh, we uh, we uh, take the trees to the we transport the trees to the factory. Transportation has some energy and some carbon emissions related to it. So we need to consider all the components of the materials that are coming into the building. Uh, where is the material being extracted? Where is it being transported? How is this transported? What are the manufacturing processes? What are the emissions related to that? What are the type of construction technologies or assemblies we are considering? Because depending upon what type of building shape or size we are using, or what, uh, what kind of structure we are adopting, the border carbon will change. And then the maintenance and replacement. How often, are, when we are talking about windows, we, we are using triple glazed windows, high energy efficient windows, but how much is the carbon footprint of the window itself? Uh, like how, how often it needs to be uh, changed, how often it needs to be maintained. Um, for example, swimming pool facilities have a lot of uh, steel and aluminum uh, in, uh, and it has to be replaced regularly. So those are a part of embodied carbon when we are replacing uh, building elements. And finally, when, when we are done with these elements, or we want, we are end of the life of a building. What happens to these components? Uh, do we just do, take them to the landfill? Do we recycle them, or do we um, reuse or uh, like make it uh, make some other use of it, or use it to produce more energy? So these are all the questions that needs to be answered when talking about embodied carbon. 
Um, this is a kind of same representation that uh, uh, what are the different kind of at different stages of a single element or single building member? What are the different kind of uh, carbon emissions that are associated with it? Um, uh, transport, production, extraction. Like you can see that every component, every single component has a huge carbon footprint. Um, so we need to talk about every component. And now uh, this is basically showing, for example, if this figure on the extreme right, uh, sorry, extreme left is a, a current carbon emissions of the whole building, then more of the component today's operational emissions. But as we are going towards more energy efficient net zero and buildings and more renewable energy sources, this uh, the component of the operational carbon is actually reducing, but the embodied carbon is remaining the same. We are not doing anything significant unless we are talking about in, 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 using more sustainable materials, the embodied car uh, in the uh, like in 10 to 30 or 40 years time, our embodied carbon will uh, portion will be uh, more than 90% of today uh, of the operational. And then we will just have this portion left to deal with for the carbon. And we know that we need to address all the possible sources of reducing emission carbon emissions as possible. Um, Okay, so why institutional buildings? Why, why I'm doing the research on institutional buildings or why is UBC interested in reducing the embodied carbons of a building? Because institutions uh, are the first place whenever we, are, we want to test something or we want to make policies or we want to uh, know uh, concrete results. And also we want to spread knowledge to the students directly. We, uh, we start with the campus, we start with the campus labs, we start with small buildings in campus. And in, in the whole sense, a, a, a whole university or a whole institution, educational buildings combined are kind of a small cities because we have a residential uh, student apartments, we have faculty housing, we have uh, offices, we have uh, laboratories. Like we have a lot of different types of buildings uh, uh, that are present in a very small area. So, uh, so if you start reducing the carbon footprints of the universities, it will be a good uh, like kind of sample, uh, an example that can be uh, taken to a larger scale of the bigger cities also. Uh, so that's why UBC is starting with improving its own sustainability policy and reducing the embodied carbon of its building. Um, First of all, what are the uh, different kind of institutional buildings? We have historic buildings, uh, we have libraries, we have academic buildings with classrooms and lecture halls. We have research facilities that are interdisciplinary. We have different kinds of housing. We have athletic and recreational facilities in these uh, universities and we have social and support facilities. So, uh, and we have cultural centers, theaters and visual art facilities. So we need to deal with how are, what are the uh, operation, uh, what are the carbon emissions of each of these buildings? and how can they be reduced as less as possible. Uh, this is an example from a study on uh, how the embodied carbon can change for, from one building type to another. For example, in here they showed that when you have a red, uh, apartment, residential apartment building, uh, most of their emissions are related to the structure of the building, the actual frame uh, of the building, but they're just 30%. The same findings are found for the office building, but they're, they're, there's a significant change in the operation. But when you talk about the envelope, uh, what are the materials being used on the envelope? The viscose of apartment buildings will usually have more glass on them or will have more balconies on them. So their envelope is possible is using more carbon emissions or more materials that is not that environmentally friendly. And uh, those materials being used in, in that office building in their study were uh, quite less. Uh, so this just illustrates that there can be significant difference in all of these buildings. And it's possible that we have to deal with each individual building in a different way when we are talking about embodied carbon. So uh, UBC embodied carbon policy is actually part of a climate action plan. Uh, climate action plan has a lot of uh, parts of, uh, it has climate justice, it has operational energy, um, it has transportation of emissions also. Uh, so uh, when, because of the uh, UBC declared climate emergency, it, it is part of one of the uh, sub policy of car, uh, uh, on climate action plan and it's a uh, carbon embodied carbon policy. And according to this, UBC is targeting to have the, all the new buildings and, the, and not only the new buildings, but it wants all of the campus buildings to have a reduced carbon footprint uh, and reduce it by 50% to what are the uh, what was the current in 2007. Uh, so this is an ambitious target. And we, but the problem is that we don't have enough data on this, neither on the embodied carbons and not on, nor on the guidelines. Everything is quite vague right now. 
Um, so uh, like these are the different parts of the campus that will uh, combine together to make the uh, whole car carbon footprint of the UBC campus. And on this, um, uh, the maintenance and replacement of the materials uh, and materials, uh, different, what are the different material types and uh, any kind of infrastructures and types of buildings that will be part of the embodied carbon plan. Uh, so the, my basic uh, steps of this policy are to develop a guideline that can help campus to evaluate what are the main steps that needs to be taken to reduce this uh, carbon emissions, what are the different methods available, what are the targets, because we don't even have concrete benchmarks right now to what these buildings need to be compared or what building materials are the better, better one to choose. And we have to conduct uh, extensive studies on campus buildings um, to see that, okay, what are the embodied carbon footprint right now? And how much they can be reduced? What are the different actions that need to be taken to reduce this? And um, sorry for the spelling error. So determining the uh, uh, and then determining uh, the practices, materials, and methods. All of these will combine together to sh show which of them is the most effective one. For example, we talk about um, there are some uh, uh, carbon sequestration materials, uh, natural materials, especially for such as wood or. Uh, like those natural materials that not only reduce the carbon footprint of the building, they are also consuming extra carbon from the environment. So we need to see and we, uh, what are the methods that will reduce uh, material use and uh, so what are the best practices. For example, first practices for reducing embodied carbon is not to construct anything at all, but it is kind of an impossibility with increasing population and increasing need of the campuses. Uh, so we need, uh, what we need is a best solution of all of the uh, available resources resources that what needs to be done if a building uh, for example uh, if the building can be maintained if it's, it can be re renovated that will be a better option than construct a demolition one demolitioning one and constructing a new one so all of these are part of the study that is uh, an ongoing project um, and I'm working on uh, almost all of these parts uh, but still it's an ongoing process and hopefully um, something good will come out of it um, and we can play our part in reducing the carbon uh, climb, uh, carbon emissions of the campus building and hopefully uh, disseminate this information so it can be used on a larger scale. Um, and thank you for listening to my presentation. Hope it was not too boring. No, Amber, that was wonderful. Um, and I really appreciate how you take the idea of a building and it's not a building, it's parts. And those parts are really important of what creates a whole, right? So thinking about the whole versus the parts. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm certain the, the work that you're doing is, is extremely valuable and, and will be very informative for the processes that are underway currently and informing future processes as well. So thank you for sharing that, much appreciated. Um, we now have uh, Manvi Bahala uh, ready to talk about youth activists' narratives on the climate crisis and ethnography of global climate strikes in Canada. Um, and this comes on the heels of a recent um, Fridays for Future global strike that we saw not that long ago. Um, and I happened to run into Manvi there. So um, the ethnogra uh, ethnography is, is, is ongoing. So Manvi, if you, uh, if you wanna take that away. Yeah, thank you, Megan. <clears throat> I'll just share my screen. Hi, everyone. So full disclosure, made this this morning. <laughs> We're going to go for it. Um, but I hope you enjoy it because I love the topic so much and it's really a developing situation. <laughs> um, so yeah, youth activists narratives on the climate crisis, ethnography of global strikes in Canada. So I actually have been to three strikes. Here you see me <laughs> three years ago three years ago, I don't know, 2019, two years ago, I guess, or whatever. Um, and this was in Waterloo, Ontario. <clears throat> a little bit about me, because it's important, you know, as a person who is observing these strikes and kind of doing the research side, um, I am both a participant and an observer in a lot of this work. Um, I'm someone who is a, a scholar activist. I'm, I'm really involved in climate justice, health and equity work, um, and just environmental justice work at large, um, both academically, but also outside of academia. And that, that part of me and my identity is really important and it shines through hopefully in, in my analyses, but also um, I, see, I see it as being um, an important part in uh, 
I mean, I really think that most of most of our research, all of our research is value laden. And I know that our values peak through. And so this is a great way for me to be able to operationalize some of the um, work that amazing work that young people are doing and that I have the opportunity to work with outside of academia and marry it with some of my interests um, in academia. So that's just a little bit about me. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the Waterloo climate strike, but because I've written that up already in the past. So if you are interested, I'm happy to share that and maybe I'll incorporate it in, in some future thing, but um, I will take you through a very, very quick glimpse into Toronto last year and kind of contrast it with this year at Vancouver. So um, Toronto, I was actually, this is more of like an auto ethnography. Um, so ethnography being like me, me going to a setting, observing a scene, um, and really as a researcher taking rigorous field notes, <laughs> um, reflective of um, my experience, but also the messaging, the narratives, the emotions, feelings, sensations of being um, at an event or at a location in a setting and really trying to capture, um, capture it and do it justice. And obviously a few slides will not do it justice. So I'm definitely gonna be writing this up and I'm happy to share it if it's of interest, but yeah, this is me speaking. And the reason I said that Toronto felt like autoethnography is because I was actually more involved than just an attendee. I was a speaker. Um, and it was really a, a unique experience because I got um, even closer with those narratives that I'm talking about. Um, being a part of that uh, process really gave me a really close look into what youth demands really are. Um, so that was interesting. And Toronto is a different kind of setting as well, which I'll show you on the next slide. But some of the key observations within the context of, of 2020 was also obviously COVID-19. And so with there was a great emphasis um, at this uh, strike that year of intersecting crises and the impacts on community resiliency, um, youth as confident leaders, because this is the second year that we've had a really big national strike and this time around it was like all of the people directing me were like in high school. <laughs> and it was so empowering to just be around these people who could occupy space with such authority and feel confident in this space. Because 2019 was really the year that a lot of this, um, a lot of the mobilization surrounding strikes uh, got the national media attention. So this is the second year and it was really evident and adults kind of knew their place, which was really cool. Um, and the third thing that I really did notice among many other things was that the media attention was a huge focus. And that's of course coming off of the edge of the 2019 strike. We know that um, public pressure kind of comes from this, um, this way, you know, through, this, through the means of media attention. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. And this is Toronto for all, all of you that maybe have not had a chance to see some of the pictures. And it was great. And you can see, you can really, in within the scene itself, you can really see people sitting spaced out. Everybody's wearing masks. And this was a huge part because youth want to be taken seriously and they want people to know that we are intelligent, we are capable, we are capable of organizing something during a pandemic that is safe and accessible. Um, there were medics, there were tents that had supplies, there, there was safety protocols, there was such great organization. Um, and it was just an, a demonstration of how I think that those, those key findings of seeing how we can embody this space and be the leaders within this. And, and it's a really um, a microcosm of how we really are gonna be able to narrate our future and uh, our future interests and determine the course of action over the next, how many ever years. <laughs> um, so coming from there, going into Vancouver, I'm new here. I'm actually from what is currently Ontario. Um, and so different key observations. This is very preliminary. I will be writing all of this up, but I really noticed that there was a greater awareness of positionality and power. Um, people that were speaking often use words like uninvited settler. That is not terminology that was used last year. Um, not at the strike in Toronto, not online, not in popular discourse. Very often, I would say. I'm not saying that it was never used, but it just wasn't as popularized. And it was really, uh, it was really interesting to see that. And a lot of people also acknowledge their own positionalities um, within the space. And this is something that is amping up across, you know, the youth movement in many regards, not just climate work, but um, being an activist, I see it in those spaces, but it was great to see it on stage when you're occupying those spaces and you're um, navigating a power dynamic where people are thinking that you know more than them. So um, really acknowledging the positionality of like, hey, I'm a, you know, this race, this ethnicity, um, I belong to this group, this is my, my worldview on this. And so you can choose and navigate your own decisions from my worldview, take what you want, you know, make of it what you will and acknowledge the limitations and the strengths of, of that positionality. 
And that was really interesting. Um, but there was also something that really struck out to me was the police aspects. Um, there was police on every corner. There were police cars parked out front. Um, they were there were in twos uh, across all aspects of the strike. And uh, the onstage commentary was consistently about getting arrested, land defense, anti-police sentiment, anti-establishment, making fun of the snap election. And it was just very like a juxtaposition of um, circumstances where you could see that there was these polarizing um, presentations of, you know, like what was happening and what what is and what we want. So that was really interesting. And some of the words used, I made a quick word map as well, which was like mass murder, violence. Um, like, you know, the language has really strengthened and it is a lot more um, what people would describe as anarchist, but that's not how I would describe it. I think it's just revolutionary, but again, that's my positionality. Um, and the third thing that I did notice a lot of was mental health and well-being is just being talked about a lot more. And there was a couple of signs that were, that were just very reflective. They're, they're directly talking about anxiety or like, this gives me anxiety, like, you know, um, and so young people are really worried. And this is, uh, this is really, present in our narratives. Quickly, I will mention that the, it was also interesting to see what kind of people showed up. Um, and it's some, something that I've noticed is that this is pretty consistent across all of the strikes. Um, and a lot of it is that there are more women than men. Of course, this is limited. This, this is just observational. And you really, you know, this is not a conclusive way in any way, because there are more than two genders. Um, but there always uh, tend to be more women or people that present as women. Um, the age is always younger. But that makes sense because student activists are primarily organizing these events. Um, however, you do see tend to see older men, which is really interesting. Um, and then race wise, I always see a lot more white passing folks um, and less visibly racialized or people that identify as indigenous and oftentimes indigenous peoples, um, they have like groups or um, like I've seen at strikes um, certain ways that you can kind of go about identifying if, if they are a member of a group and they've taken space on the stage or um, X, Y, Z, there's context-based um, dependencies with this. But so this is just a quick observational thing to kind of say that it isn't just the most um, homogenous, uh, you know, group. It is like diverse, but diversity airing in certain areas, which is also interesting. You know, who are these strikes accessible to? Who are they reaching out to and who's able to show up? Um, main messages was really interesting in Vancouver. These were the three big things this year, which was really cool. Took a lot of video content that I had to go through to kind of tally it up. But these were sort of the big themes, which was really interesting. It's so different in Ontario. You would never find forests, fairy creek or conservation as being the key ones for sure. Um, and there aren't as many pipeline ones. I mean, there's divest and fossil fuel ones, but you know, anti TMX like pipelines are very BC in some ways. So um, yeah. Lastly, I'm like running through this <laughs> um, key narratives. I, I just wanted to highlight a couple quotes because of course that's the, that's the, to me, it's the best part and there's so many and I just really had a hard time picking, but these were the shortest ones that I thought did some justice to some of the, you know, key things. Uh, one was don't call this work, call this a privilege. And this is an indigenous elder speaking about our shared duty to care and take action on stage. Um, a lot of, uh, I felt like a lot of it also dove into relationality and I know that's an emerging theme that many western academic curricula is like people are trying to tap into that more with traditional knowledge presence um, in their work and their research and I think relationality came up a lot finding a role we need you a student activist at UBC um, was saying this in a way to demonstrate the inclusivity of this movement and this is great it speaks to how student activists constantly strive to get more of them, get more people to join us and in ways that are the most community centered because they're acknowledging of you know like we all have different parts and pieces to play within this movement but we're all needed and we should all feel welcome and then this is a sticky point that really uh, stuck out to me but a youth activist from SFU um, was speaking in reference to the resistance from their institution and supporting their activism this was you know this is kind of uh, out in popular discourse on Twitter um, and on, I believe, news coverage a little bit about SFU students and um, they had gotten in trouble for a mural on climate justice, which was painted with removable paints, like it was like water 
you could just, you know, like wash it off. And they got in trouble for it. And, and this was really, really inappropriate responses what the students said. I'm not speaking for them, but this is paraphrasing. And within that speech, they said, well, change doesn't take time, it takes pressure. And I think this is a good summary of the mentality that many student activists were taking and kind of are taking and have taken um, on this topic. And it really speaks to the ethos of strikes. Um, so my conclusion is not a conclusion. Um, this is a research question. It says, how can the perspectives of student activists directly and intentionally contribute to institutional change with respect to climate justice? I mean, all of this really speaks to the intelligence, expertise, independence, autonomy of young people, um, particularly young student activists, because we have these affiliations, these dual identities. We, we care about the science and we care about institutional change and systems change. Um, and we see, you know, the resources of our institution being able to support that, but there's so many barriers because our institutions are also extensions of Western colonial settler, you know, um, practices. So in some ways it's difficult, you know, how do we navigate the aspects of radical climate justice within these environments and how do our identities um, and our well-being, you know, how authentic are our identities and how does our well, how can our well-being prosper? So we need more research. This is my last slide, I promise I'm running through this, um, but uh, we're doing some more work. So I'm climate policy lead at UBC Climate Hub and I'm working on some research. And so I'm gonna be doing some photo voice and some interviews and I'm gonna be making a report. So if you like this stuff and you wanna know more, hopefully we can put out some, some work that can help empower more student activists, um, but also help the institution find ways to better support student activists in this critical work because so much past literature and also just lived experiences can tell you that, you young people are clearly shaping the whole movement. I don't think we would have had the progress we've had. And this is my personal opinion. I don't think we would have had this progress without the bravery and um, the kind of the gall and the, the perseverance of young people in the face of sort of these very oppressive structures. Um, so that is it. <laughs> Thank you for the time that you've given me and your attention. Thank you for your time and thank you for your reflections and thank you for your work. Um, I, you, I feel like you just touched on so many salient points um, that require their own talk. <laughs> um, break that up into several different parts. Um, you know, just looking at taking you seriously and the organizing capacity and skillfulness that, that youth has been able to uh, bring to this, this climate landscape um, is, is so powerful um, and there's so much there. And so making sure that that's honored and, and I love that you're spotlighting that and giving it space and, and looking at it in, in the ways that you are to see how we can use that to partnership and, and make sure that we're thinking about future generations by looking to future generations um you know as they up and come into into these spaces and systems and and how they can reimagine them and, and redream them and i really find it interesting how there's different climate cultures between different regions um, and different protests in different cities so i think that's really interesting as well so thank you so much for that work um, and again, we'll connect folks to any resources that uh, presenters want to uh, give us that we can share uh, with folks who attended today. Uh, and with that, we will um, move on to uh, Kevin Liang, who is stepping into the climate mic today, um, our next on stage, uh, a carbon footprint study of the Canadian Medical Residency Interview Tour. Uh, I've heard a lot about this recently, so I'm really interested, uh, Kevin, what you have to you know, share on this. Um, I've heard this in relationship to climate and emissions and things like that. So welcome, Kevin, and looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Megan. I, I appreciate the, uh, um, the introduction, and thank you, Linda, for telling me about this awesome event and learn lots from it. I'm just going to share my screen, and um, I'll start the timer right away. One second here. So uh, I realized the introduction or the, the title I had earlier was a bit of a mouthful. Uh, and it's not the most exciting title I had earlier. So I just switched it up a little bit last minute. And uh, instead of talking about the specifics of the research project itself, um, which I'm happy to talk to anyone about at any time, I'm going to give it more of a narrative spin, a little bit about the background and how I came to this research project and where I see it going and uh, my hopes for it. So again, I'm, my name is Kevin. I'm a family practice resident based out of unceded Coast Seal Storage Territory. I'm in my last year of residency. Um, yeah, so, um, so here, um, 
um, I really need to um, talk about this point even more, but climate crisis is a single biggest health threat to facing humanity. It is very much a health crisis. And as someone who works in healthcare, it's something that I'm seeing more and more of and becoming uh, much more concerned of every, every year. Just this past summer, that unprecedented heat dome that essentially flipped the lives of some of the patients I've seen around the a season of intense wildfires where people were presenting with asthma for the very first time. Um, and I think the worst part the thing about all of this is that it's something that's just gonna get worse and worse unless we take immediate action. So as someone who's gonna be joining the health professional soon, it's a it's very it's very much something that's always on the top of my mind and something um, that I keep um, a work a field that I've been um, doing quite a bit of work in. Um, so not only is the healthcare sector vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, but it also contributes to it. It's, it's something that we don't think about or talk about too often. But um, in recent studies that showed that if the global healthcare sector were a country, it would actually be the fifth largest greenhouse gas emitter on the planet. But that's quite significant in my mind. And uh, between 2009 and 2015, 4.6% of our emissions was from healthcare alone. And where it comes from is actually most of it from the supply chain of uh, production, transfer, and disposal of goods, as we see in the photo on the left. Oops. Okay, so as someone who's going through the process of becoming a doctor, um, I definitely felt both the burden of uh, the incoming climate crisis and as well as the contrib contribution of healthcare on the climate, um, on climate. But I think climate change is an issue of equity and of power. Those in positions of power have the most um, sway in affecting um, in, in emissions. And as someone who is starting as an undergraduate student um, to medical school, I felt really powerless to try to affect change in my own sector. Um, as we can see in this diagram from that paper I referenced earlier, most of it came from supply chain, from like hospital electricity, all these things that I really don't have much say over. Um, so again, about the Canadian medical training process, this is when I found there was actually something stuck in there that was very polluting and something that we can do about, and I really wanted to talk more about, and that's the um, residency interview process. So at the end of med school, uh, medical students fly all across Canada, and um, as well as the U.S., to interview for different um, places. In 2020, I was one of the medical students that took place, um, and on average, 21.6 program, which is quite a number of um, of programs. So these are some of the photos I took as an applicant traveling across from Calgary to Toronto, Montreal, except and more. All to just end back uh, in Vancouver. So what I did uh, leading up to this process, I contacted Simon, uh, Dr. Donner at the uh, Department of Geography and talked about this um, thing called my Carmen's Flipper. I really want to bring attention to the impact of flying and really as a way to start conversation about um, how much healthcare is emitting and how we can do more as a profession and also get people kind of excited about it. So um, over just before the interview break, I created this website and I sent it out to um, the class and, um, just to get awareness of what's happening. So we had over 900 people respond to the survey, which is very exciting. And we were able to calculate around uh, 5,480, uh, 5,948 flights were taken in total. And what that translates to was a 4,239 tons of carbon uh, dioxide equivalent, so averaging 1.44. This is all big numbers that it's kind of hard to uh, kind of imagine. So um, the next slide shows that um, in terms of staying within our two degrees carbon budget, this is something that's almost taken up a huge proportion of it with um, it's something just not feasible in the future. Uh, so people certainly were very excited about this. It was something um, that had a lot of attention. So we just kept pushing on it. Um, with COVID-19, the interviews turned into a virtual process. But the talks are going back to the in-person format. So we actually started a petition or a sign letter, and we got over 500 signatures all across Canada, really pushing the key decision makers with our data saying we need to keep the process virtual. It's just not consistent with climate science. Um, in the last five seconds, I'll talk about the lessons I've learned. So number one, I think um, just going through the process, I think finding methods of decarbonization is um, is as difficult as a learner, especially when you're trying to learn med learn about medicine, but you're also seeing how much uh, your sector is polluting. But I think there's always countless areas that requires a drastic systemic shift, and I was lucky to be able to look see one that um, that occurs in medicine with the CARMS tour. And I found that drawing attention to these resources, uh, to these sources of mission in visually accessible format can be helpful. Talking about them in a way that people haven't seen them before was something that I found quite effective. 
And as, as always, I think public support is critical in this case uh, with the, the letter and decision of CARMS will be coming soon in the future. We'll know whether it stays virtual or not. And given that it is a, a slam posium, I was gonna end up with a haiku that I wrote last night. I don't know if it, I think I checked the syllables. I think it works, uh, but if it doesn't, uh, let me know. And uh, thank you everyone, and especially to my co-authors on this paper. Um, feel free to reach out to me anytime for any questions. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I love that you put a haiku in the end there too. Um, I think that's great. Um, and I, I really do appreciate, you know, again, I think it ties back to some of the themes we've heard in earlier presentations of um, what's your role in the space that you're in and the network that you're in um, for climate action. And one of those things, like you said, hey, I just see an opportunity here and this is what we, this is how we do it. Do we need to do it this way? And so kind of digging into that and looking at this practice and um, teasing it apart to, to see what we could do about it. So uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and this is, uh, we have uh, one more presenter today. Um, and this is, where we're moving into hybrid between digital uh, virtual presentations and in-person presentations. We actually have an in-person presenter today. Uh, Leah Schultz is going to be our next presenter. Um, and we're just gonna take a second and transition. Leah's gonna take my spot here um, and give you their presentation from here. Uh, so we're just gonna get set up uh, and it'll just be one moment. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'll be presenting my research today in the format of a TED talk. And I'd like to begin by asking all of you what comes to mind when I say the words rainforest and conservation in DC. The majority might think of all the national parks in DC that they've visited. Beautiful nature, lots of green, big trees. Others might add, DC is a green leader. It protects its natural resources and is at the forefront of climate action. And if you might even say, there's a rainforest in DC, there's a generally very positive connotation reflected um, that we can also see in the news. I Googled those words and looked at the headlines about DC. What came up was new investments in DC parks create more access to nature or conservation and cultures at the heart of newly protected areas, or BC government and First Nations reach an agreement. I'd like to take this moment to introduce a concept, which is confirmation bias, or the tendency to search for and favor information in a way that confirms or supports our prior beliefs and values. On the example of forestry management in BC, I'd like to explain to you today how confirmation bias prevents us from taking effective climate action which leads to the development and escalation of societal conflicts. And I will do that by looking at BC's rainforests through the pillars of sustainability with three different perspectives and deconstructing our assumptions step by step. So the first perspective would be the ecological one with the assumption that rainforests in BC are pristine and protected natural areas and not really more important than any other forest for climate action. In fact, BC's temperate climate has had few disturbances over the millennia, and this has created an ecosystem with unusually large and old trees, some up to 2000 years old, referred to as old growth or ancient trees and very high levels of biodiversity. To give some context, scientists have found that BC's old growth forests actually store more carbon per square meter of biomass than the Amazon rainforest, which is known as the lungs of our planet. 
And this shows why BC's rainforest is crucial for climate action and globally relevant. But despite these facts, the old growth forests are not all protected and pristine. Instead, they're the most lucrative lumber product on the market, which leads us to our second perspective, the economic one, with the assumption that old growth logging is an important source of jobs and a contributor to BC's GDP. While with less than 3% of productive old growth forests left in BC and less than 20% of old growth left in the world, we know that jobs will actually diminish within the next few years if old growth logging continues. And yes, while logging of second growth goes on, studies have shown that replanted trees don't grow back as efficiently since forestry practices like clear cutting a forest and the use of monocultures further the soil degradation and the loss of biodiversity. So while old growth logging is currently very profitable, it isn't sustainable. Economic studies have also shown that old growth forests are actually worth more standing economically than logged. So instead of forestry, we should look towards the tourism industry, which holds a future potential for pursuing both profit and sustainability. Now, lastly, the political and social perspective, with the assumption that the BC government does prioritize climate action, and if truly necessary, it would act to protect these last 3% of old growth. Let's have a look. The BC Premier John Horgan did campaign on the promise of protecting BC's old growth forests. However, since his election, the rate of cut has actually increased rather than decreased. In the last year alone, by 43%. Due to public pressure, an independent strategic review was commissioned by the government and done by forestry experts in 2020 that recommended both a moratorium on old growth logging and a fundamental paradigm shift in forestry practices. Two actions that weren't followed up on thus far. In addition, several indigenous communities like the Squamish, Pachidat, and Dididat called for deferrals and moratoriums on commercial logging in their territories this summer, many of which also haven't been acted upon so far. So let's go back to where we started. We became aware of our own assumptions as well as the role of media and confirmation bias. And then we took a closer look at the reality of forestry management in BC through the pillars of sustainability, which show that BC does have a globally relevant and valuable rainforest. It pursues logging profit relentlessly still. And so far, the government has ignored the scientific facts and the will of the public and indigenous communities. So my question is, what happens when the institutional systems that we have put in place to prevent and mitigate crises like the climate emergency fail? A societal conflict erupts. We've reached a point in the climate emergency where the public feels the need to form a last line of defense between the economy and nature. And this is exactly what happened in BC. The sense of climate inaction and lack of accountability that we observed in those three pillars has resulted in public protests and blockades on Vancouver Island that have been in place for over a year. So the public decided essentially to use civil disobedience to highlight an environmental injustice and problem, meaning it acted against the law in a peaceful manner, which historically has been a tactic um, and an indicator of social change, as well as a catalyst for political change. I spent my summer on Vancouver Island at the Ferry Creek blockades with those protesters and observed how the government, the logging corporations and the judiciary handled this conflict. When the institutions responded to civil disobedience with police force, the conflict escalated. And to just give you an idea of the scope, this summer, the Fair Creek blockades became the longest ongoing act of civil disobedience in Canadian history with over 1,100 arrests within the last five months. Would you say you still think about BC in the same way? Probably not. And this is an important shift in perception because it highlights a general phenomenon that we often try to reconcile the harsh reality with data that supports our hope that everything is and will be well, when in fact, the truth is that it's often not that easy. We can draw valuable lessons from what is currently happening in BC to formulate solutions on how to deal with these societal conflicts that avoid escalation, since they will only increase in number as the climate emergency continues. So in conclusion, in order for all of us to move towards effective climate adaptation, we must act. And in order for us to act, we must be aware of the challenges that we must overcome. 
But in order for us to know these challenges, we must first and foremost deconstruct the assumption that we don't have any. Thank you very much. And for those who are interested in more information as part of the team, I've consolidated some of these takeaways in an international awareness toolkit that I'm happy to share in the future if anyone reaches out to UBC Sustainability. Thank you very much. Magic of digital. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Leah. I'm going to look over to Leah because Leah is actually here in the room. So uh, thank you for that. Um, there were so many wonderful points in that that I think really resonate with the changing of, of times um, and how we're situated in certain systems that work certain ways and recognizing that it doesn't work anymore. Um, and so, you know, the forests are more valuable standing for many, many ways as opposed to just an economic perspective, right? Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Much appreciated. I am. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. Uh, Leah was the last of our uh, presenters today, and I just want to take a moment um, to foster here. I'm going to um, stop my screen share for a moment to foster some collective appreciation uh, for our speakers today and for the work that they're doing, um, the focuses that they've chosen um, and, and willing to take the time to communicate um, their work to us today. Um, the communication of this work is such a critical part of, of climate action, climate awareness, climate knowledge, building community um, and addressing some of these, these really complex uh, interconnected challenges. So I just want to extend a really massive thank you to all of you today uh, for, for, for being here with us and sharing with us. Um, and I also want to take a minute to come back to you, Andrea, and, and have a bit of a check in. Uh, we have been throwing stuff at you very quickly all afternoon. Um, and I have seen you kind of glancing back and, and going between your artboard and the, and the computer screen as you listen and interpret and kind of think through this process artistically. Uh, so I just want to give you a moment to update us on where you're at. Oh, am I on? Yeah. Where am I? Can you see me, everybody? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yes, what a what a um, exciting and whirlwind afternoon. So these are the preliminary preliminary sketches. Um, with some of the highlights of some of the work that's been done today. Um, and what I'll be doing is working on these. Here's Catherine's working on these to kind of make them a little more cohesive, work on some of the drawings and tie them all together um, into, yeah, one very large piece that connects all these wonderful pieces today. And there we go. And then um, individual pieces too. I had this idea while everyone was presenting that kind of like a bingo board. So everyone will have their own small vignette and then we'll have also a larger sense of all this uh yeah incredible discussion and knowledge and sharing today thank you everybody oh thank you um it's so exciting to see uh, your interpretation of all of this um, and as you grab it. And I think it, it's such a critical tool, again, of communication. Um, and I think it's something really valuable that we can share with the audience um, afterwards to, um, you know, in, a, in conversations with you, Andrew, you said to maintain the momentum um, and, and have this conversation on Friday. But, you know, moving into next week and in the future, we'll have some of these illustrations and images that we can connect to and, and circulate and share. Um, to reflect on and remember and kind of use as inspiration for moving forward at the same time. Uh, so much appreciated uh, for this whole process that you're engaging in with us and alongside us as well. Yeah. Yeah, just quickly say thank you to everybody. It was so inspiring and my I wish only wish my hand could go faster. <laughs> so I'll be able to watch these again and get more from it. But wow, thank you so much. We're happy for you to go as fast or as slow as you need. One person can only do so much. And uh, there was a lot covered today. So we're appreciative of, of what you grasp and how you capture, yeah. Um, so at this time, um, what we're going to start to do is we're going to start transitioning into some of the breakout rooms that we have organized for kind of the workshop portion and discussion portion of uh, today's event. 
Uh, and so we're going to have um, five breakout rooms. I'm actually going to share my screen because I will give folks um, a bit of an overview of what that can look like. Navigating screens is always the fun part. And I'm just going to readjust. Okay, so folks should be able to see uh, a slide that says breakout rooms um, with a few um, manta rays with some cities on their backs. Um, the idea of just us going into our little pods um, and having some discussion uh, as we float through some of the uh, conversations and thoughts and themes and issues that have been uh, addressed and discussed today. So there's five breakout rooms and the first breakout room, uh, Indigenous worldviews, second breakout room, engagement and advocacy, third breakout room, partnerships, fourth breakout room, emissions reductions, and the fifth uh, room is climate well-being. We're going to have the um, folks should be able to see the breakout room options on their screen. Uh, those should come up for folks and they're labeled um, in the in the order that I just explained there. And we'll have folks sort into those rooms. Um, and once you're sorted into your room, we're going to just take a, a quick moment, uh, maybe, you know, three, four, five minutes max, to, again, for folks to just take a stretch, have a drink, use a loo, whatever you need to do um, before we move into that uh, conversation. Uh, but when, go, go to your room first, take a little break, and then that room will get started. So if folks want to transition into the breakout room that they feel drawn to, uh, feel connected to. In those breakout rooms, we will have some of the speakers. Uh, there will also be facilitators in each of those rooms to just help explore some conversation and discussion and um, offer some guiding questions if, if uh, needed. Folks are open you know, and, and, and encouraged to ask questions and kind of just explore the issues that we were uh, addressing and covering today and those connections that they see uh, to all of those things as well. So I encourage you to go ahead and, and choose your breakout room. And if you need help, you can always come back to the main room. If you decide to change your breakout room, uh, you can go back to the main room and, and readdress if you'd like to as well. If you have any questions, um, I think our, our tech moderator can also support with that. Question, Megan, um, do we have our fifth facilitator? Sorry, I was just trying to find my mute, uh, unmute button. Um, I am, I'm not sure. Nadia, go ahead. Sorry, you're on mute. Oh, you can't unmute, is that the problem? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. There you um, go, yeah. I, I don't have an option popping up for, for a breakout room, so I'm not sure, um, yeah, if I can either be assigned one or I'm not sure which one, yeah, you guys need me to facilitate and pop into. Is anyone else having trouble assigning to a room? because we can assign it if, if uh, need. Samantha, Emmett. Oh, and there's there's a note from John in the chat saying he, they're figuring out this breakout room thing ASAP, stay tuned. Okay, so, okay, that sounds good. There's always a small snag folks. This is, you know, technology is smooth until it's not. So, uh, but we will we will get folks connected to a room. Um, one of the things that I can encourage folks to do uh, for folks who aren't able to assign themselves, um, if you know how to rename yourself in Zoom, uh, that, that's how you go to the, you go to the three little dots. If you hover over your image and you go to the three little dots and click on it, you can rename yourself. If you rename yourself with the room that you'd prefer, um, you can just say room one, room two, room three, room four. Um, and by, by all means, we'll, we'll assign you to that room.
and I appreciate your patience. But we will get folks connected to their breakout rooms so that we can continue the conversation and discussion, which I always find to be one of the rich, rich parts of, of this process is to just be able to have a moment to debrief all of the amazing information and ideas and uh, themes and issues that folks bring forward in their work and research. I also just want to point out that these uh, manta rays are Megan's art. Uh, we're giving credit to, oh, they're not. Oh no, I thought that was your style. Just kidding, Never mind. No, these particular ones aren't, but I, I, I found manta rays and I digitally put the cities on their back because that's what I do. So uh, I, I collaged them together, let's say. So not my original work, but uh, I, I did collage the cities onto them. I feel like we're seeing some movement with breakout rooms, but we'll keep folks posted. And just a reminder, uh, folks can, um, I, I see folks have been renaming themselves and as you rename yourself with the number, um, again, to rename, you click on the three little dots. Um, if you hover over your image, you click on the three little dots in the blue square, and then you just choose um, rename option. On my screen, it's the last option in, in the pop-up menu. Um, and then you can just add the number of the room. So for example, room one, room three, room four, Nadia, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I've been randomly hitting reactions. That uh, was an unintentional hand raise. That's but okay, just, yeah. Just a shout out to your MCing, Megan. You did a fantastic job for keeping the energy going and, and just well done to all the, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, the snaps. So so I don't know if all of you are aware, but um, for, for people who are deaf, the way that you applaud is, is by shaking your hands. And so I thought that was a really nice addition to the Zoom is just being able to, to show your love and applause with, uh, with some handshakes there. I love the energy of that. And I love, yeah, just having to be able to communicate appreciation or applause and, and showing the snaps or showing the hands, I think is a really lovely uh, way to incorporate that into the Zoom, the Zoom world and the Zoom platform as well. Yeah. Uh, we're still sorting folks, uh, that's still underway. So we're getting folks into rooms as uh, they rename themselves. Again, if there is a breakout room that you particularly want to go to, uh, again, room one, Indigenous worldviews, room two, engagement and advocacy, room three, partnerships, room four, emissions reductions, room five, climate well-being. Um, we will, if you rename yourself and just put your put the number, so again, uh, hover over your screen image, go to the three little dots, click on that, and it will give you an option that says rename, and then you can just add uh, the number of the room that you would like, and we will see that on our end, uh, and then we can add you to a room. We're getting there. Thanks everyone. Much appreciated for your patience.
Uh, hi, Jonathan, are you there? Hi, yes, I am. Yeah, hi, I am Sarnik. Uh, I would like to be assigned to room five, if it's possible. Yeah, just hold on. Thank you, thank you very much.
Greetings, everyone. Um, I think everyone is filtering back in from their breakout rooms. Um, I hope um, that everyone had an opportunity to engage in some really lovely, thought-provoking um, community building discussions. I know I did in my room and um, I really appreciated the time and the thoughts and just where it was able to meander and the things we were able to cover um, and just have that opportunity to connect with folks who are thinking about these things and working on these things and um, are curious about different parts of these things. And so it was really lovely space. And I hope that all of you got to share a lovely space uh, in your breakout room as well. Um, I'm just moving some stuff around on my screen here. Okay. Um, so I do wanna say uh, thank you to everyone. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to the presenters today. Um, you really are this event. Yes, I'm going to follow Nadia on this. Um, you, you really created this event um, for us by the work that you're doing and um, the time and energy and effort that you're committing to these issues. And so thank you for communicating that with us. By your communicating this, uh, you are helping to expand our, our climate knowledge, our climate awareness, our climate community, um, and build community at the same time. I think uh, folks have made some connections in, in this space that, uh, that we can move forward into other partnerships and collaborations and awarenesses. So that's really wonderful. And thank you so much for that. Um, Thank you, Linda, for our welcome. Uh, thank you to um, you know the entire behind the the scenes team, uh, Nadia, Pablo, um, John, um, Natalie, uh, Tim. Um, you know, there's 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 a lot of folks uh, who needed to come together to put this on, and uh, it is the collaboration. It's the beauty of collaboration that makes something like this possible. Uh, and then I also want to uh, thank the partners today. So again, um, University Sustainability Initiative, uh, the Climate Hub, Campus and Community Planning, Center for Community Engaged Learning and SEEDS. Um, again, it's, it's a collaborative event and these partnerships are, are what make it really rich and really special. And then I also want to uh, thank you, Andrea, for your wonderful uh, graphic interpretation today. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing that. Um, I'm gonna follow again, Nadia. Um, really looking forward to what you're capturing and how you are able to put that into a, an artistic illustrative um, rendition of, of what we experienced today and the things that we shared and experienced today. Um, and then I also really want to thank the audience for showing up today. Uh, again, time is time is precious and we appreciate your time and we value your time and we value your presence um, and your curiosity uh, and your willingness to uh, stay with us for an afternoon, a very rainy, from what I can tell, afternoon uh, headed into a weekend. So uh, this our, our entire team that put this on, uh, we wish you well and we thank you. And um, we will follow up next week with a resource packet uh, for folks to connect with anything that we kind of linked or used today so that folks have that opportunity to uh, stay connected and keep the momentum going. And if I have forgotten anything or anybody, I do apologize. Please step in if somebody needs to uh, fill a gap that I have missed at the same time. Thank you so much, everyone. And we should all just thank Megan too. <laughs> Great job, uh, Megan, for all of your just last minute uh, coming together and, and pulling off being the uh, MC. It's a hard job. It's late. <laughs> it's my pleasure. It really is. It's really an honor. Uh, I feel very privileged to be able to uh, engage in this space with everyone. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks to Fisa too for coming in and for the facilitation as well. How, how did it go in your room? It was awesome. Um, I had the, the fortune of sharing that room with uh, Nadia um, and just oh, sent uh, an email to just connect and, and say hello because 
just shared some awesome cool things. Um, yeah, I mean, we had mostly like elderly members and um, they were just kind of talking about how um, like isolation um, is kind of getting in the way of, of uh, climate of wellness and um, sharing their own like strategies for, for staying well. And a lot of that was like action, which was great to hear. Um, so it was a wonderful conversation. And yeah, thanks for letting me be part of this space. Um, nice to meet you all. And Nafisa, I want to apologize. I didn't say thank you to you publicly. I apologize. I knew I would forget somebody or something. I'm so sorry. No worries. We do thank this you for, for your support. The recognition, right? So yeah. Is there like a checkout process, or are we good to head out? I think we're going to end the video stream, um, and I think it will cut out, and um, we will all be jettisoned into our own digital worlds after that. Yeah.